After a person is infected with something for the first time, it takes about a week in order for antibodies to really be ramped up in production and to be present in the blood. So it takes about a week to get to that point. Um, in this case, the person will get sick. Once those antibodies are really in production, then they will start to hopefully get over uh, their sickness. But an interesting thing happens um, so this is a, a graph showing plasma antibody concentrations. So again, about a week and then production starts to ramp up. An interesting thing happens if that same person is later exposed to the same pathogen. Um, they don't have to go through this whole process the second time around. The second time around, antibody production, look at this, it spikes extremely fast within a couple of hours. And look at the levels. The levels are just way higher than anything we saw in the primary response. Um, so the second time around, probably this person is never even going to feel sick. They probably won't even know that they were exposed to anything. Um, so this is due to the immunological memory that we have. This is why it's so key to have memory B cells. They stick around and they remember infections um, so that the response can be much more efficient the next time. So this is called active immunity. Active immunity can be induced by a primary infection, um, but it can also be induced by other means. We can use vaccines in order to have the body go through this first production process. Um, the vaccine triggers the body to start producing antibodies, and then the next time, if there is a next time, if we're exposed to that same pathogen, the thing that we were vaccinated for, um, then the body is ready to go. It's ready to just jump into that secondary response, which is much quicker. So in that case, the person wouldn't get sick or their sickness would be much less severe than what they would have had to go through had they not been vaccinated. So vaccines, how do we make vaccines? There are a few different possible ways for making vaccines and um, they can be used either to, to develop vaccines against viruses or against bacteria. Either one is possible. We'll focus in on um, vaccines for viruses right here. So if we're trying to make a vaccine to teach the immune system about a particular virus, it makes sense to consider what is the structure of that virus? What is it that's on the outside surface um, of the virus, right? Because that's the thing that our immune system needs to be able to recognize and to target. So a lot of times um, with the vaccines that we have, a lot of times it's actually just a vaccine that includes essentially a copy of one of those surface molecules. Um, so maybe a protein that exists on the surface of the virus. Um, if that's in our vaccine, then a lot of times that's enough to teach our immune system what to look for, what to watch out for. Um, so a few different possibilities of how this can be achieved, how we can make these, vir these vaccines. We'll just take a look at a few examples here. There are others not listed uh, on this slide, but a few of the more common approaches for making vaccines. So number one, killed virus vaccine. In a killed virus vaccine, we start out with an actual virus, a collection of virus particles, and um, we deactivate them somehow. So either we could treat them with heat or with some type of chemical treatment, something that inactivates the virus so that then it's no longer able to replicate in our cells. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of like, it's safe to put it in the body. Like even if we put it in the body, it's not going to start, um, it's not going to start up an infection, but still all of the same structural components are present. So that's enough to, to show our immune system what it needs to build antibodies against. Um, that's the type of vaccine that the salt polio vaccine was. It was a killed virus vaccine. Another type of vaccine is a live virus vaccine. So as its name implies, this vaccine actually does contain virus that is active. It's capable of replicating um, in many cases, not always, but um, it's, it's derived from a sort of normal virus. However, it's been attenuated. So we've, we've replicated it enough times and selected for strains that don't cause really severe disease symptoms. We say that it's attenuated. And so when we introduce this virus into the body, um, either it can't replicate or, um, or if it can replicate, it doesn't cause disease symptoms. So it's not going to cause problems. Um, so live virus vaccines, these are pretty interesting. They're, they're kind of strange to think about. The live virus vaccines, we're actually putting virus into our bodies. We really are. Um, and this is the type of vaccine that is the, the MMR vaccine. This is the one that's um, given for 
measles, mumps, and rubella. This is first given at 12 months of age, typically. And it works really well. This has been given for a long time. Um, it's very safe and um, it, it works great. So that's a good example of a live virus vaccine. Coming down our list here, another type of vaccine would be a recombinant vaccine. And this typically involves some genetic engineering, genetically engineered vaccines. Um, the example that we have right here for you is hepatitis B, the hepatitis B vaccine. This is one where they, they started off with the hepatitis B virus and um, they took out just the part of the genome that encodes for one of those surface proteins like I was talking about. Um, they took the gene that encodes that surface protein and they inserted that gene into a yeast cell. And so they took the gene from the virus and they put it into a yeast cell and, um, and then essentially that yeast cell can be replicated and become the source of our vaccine. So the yeast cell, it doesn't contain any of the other uh, virus components. It's not capable of replicating. The virus is not capable of replicating because it's literally just one surface protein that's present in the yeast genome now at this point. So that's, that's an interesting example of genetic engineering recombinant vaccines. Um, have allowed us to produce the hepatitis B vaccine. And this is one that is, um, it's really kind of amazing how it works. So this is one that is given pretty much on the very first day that, that a baby is born. And the reason is because if the mother has hepatitis B, then during childbirth, sometimes the baby is exposed to the mother's blood. And so the baby might be infected with hepatitis B right there at childbirth. If we give this vaccine within, I think it's the first 12 hours after childbirth, um, if we give the vaccine within 12 hours, then that's soon enough to, to actually teach the immune system what to do quickly enough um, so that the baby is not infected with hepatitis B. So that's pretty neat. Okay, finally on this list, um, I went ahead and added mRNA vaccines. This is the type of vaccine that, that has been given for um, preventing COVID. And mRNA vaccines, they're really interesting. They're very new. I should say they're relatively new. They've been around for decades being studied in animals. Um, and they were recently sort of targeted towards um, the virus that causes COVID. And with an mRNA vaccine, all it is essentially is a little piece of mRNA. We know about mRNAs, right? Those are the molecules that encode proteins. Um, so this vaccine has a piece of mRNA that gets injected into us into our arm and then our cells take up that mRNA and interpret it so they start building the protein that's encoded on the mRNA strand and it's actually one of the surface uh, proteins from the virus that causes COVID SARS-CoV-2 um, so that's kind of interesting because it's using our own cells to produce this viral protein and having that present is enough for our immune systems to learn what that surface protein looks like. And then our immune systems can start, again, building antibodies against it. So those are a few examples of different types of vaccines, different ways that vaccines can be produced. Um, sometimes, sometimes, another note here, sometimes vaccines are targeted towards particular age groups. They can have different additives depending on the age group that they're designed for. And that's kind of interesting. So one example of that is adding um, adjuvants. These are molecules that tend to activate the immune system a little bit more than normal. So they tend to cause a little bit more inflammation. So it's sort of like really drawing attention to, to from the immune system um, that there's um, that there are particles present to pay attention to and learn to build out antibodies towards. So adjuvants, these are sometimes added to, um, for example, the flu vaccine for elderly. I think it's for people over 65. A lot of times the, the version of the flu virus um, vaccine has adjuvants added. That's a mouthful. Okay, so that's, I think that's all the examples we're going to go through um, for vaccines. Again, there are even more types than what we have listed out here, but this is just to give a general idea. There's also something called passive immunity. Whereas active immunity involves our own bodies producing antibodies, passive immunity is something different. Passive immunity involves sort of handing off antibodies from one individual to another. And there are a few natural examples of this and there are some unnatural examples of this. Um, this is what happens with mothers. So uh, how, 
how the mother's immune system protects the fetus is through passive immunity, the fact that her antibodies can be transmitted into the fetus. After childbirth, same thing, but through breast milk. And then we've also got um, one example down here for artificial passive immunity. A good example of this is antivenom for snake bites. So this is something where um, I think this is usually developed in animal subjects, like I'm not sure if it's sheep, I, uh, sheep, pigs, or cows. Anyway, um, what happens is a small amount of the venom is given to the animal, not a lethal dose, but just a little bit, enough to trigger the animal to start producing antibodies. And then we collect the antibodies from the animal and use that um, to, for, to treat people who have been snake bit. So that's another example of passive immunity.